The dangers of nuclear power and nuclear weapons is clear to all, but throughout history, there are examples of the consequences of nuclear fallout and disasters being hidden. In today's video, we will look at some nuclear catastrophes that you've likely never heard of. First, we will look at the Konosupo irradiated milk scandal of 1988. I can imagine that you have all heard of the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, the worst nuclear disaster in history. The fallout from the reactor explosion resulted in radioactive contamination affecting much of Europe, even as far afield as Northern Ireland. All manner of radioactive isotopes, including iodine-131, cesium-137, and strontium-90. These were carried on the wind currents and fell onto the ground in the rain, contaminating dairy pastures in Northern Ireland. When cows consumed the contaminated grass, they would produce contaminated milk. Many of these isotopes are biologically active. For example, cesium-137 behaves like potassium and spreads through soft tissues like muscles and organs, while strontium-90 behaves a bit like calcium, accumulating in bones and teeth. This is dangerous, as these isotopes become absorbed by the body, irradiating the body from within. Once ingested, they are absorbed into tissues and continue to irradiate the body from the inside, causing long-term health effects, including cancer and genetic damage. Cesium-137 in particular emits beta particles and gamma rays. These can cause direct damage to cells. But for the cows, it meant that these isotopes entered the milk production process, contaminating the milk from within. And some of this contaminated milk was rendered into a long-lasting powdered form, allowing for ease of export and storage. Following the Chernobyl disaster, many were concerned about damage to the economy, especially in areas like the dairy industry. Many governments sought to downplay the risk of contamination, in a bid to save a vital industry, but knowingly putting lives at risks doing so. In 1987, the Mexican government purchased around 41 tons of contaminated milk powder. It did this through a nationalised company known as Conosupo, the national company of popular substance. This was a company designed to offer subsidised food to the Mexican people. And in particular, it was designed to help the poorest, those at risk of malnutrition. This distribution programme ensured that the poorest had access to decent food, and a big part of the programme was ensuring that milk was available. What's not entirely clear is whether the sellers of the contaminated milk actually knew the milk was contaminated, whether there was an accidental failure in the testing, or whether there was some kind of attempts to hide the fact the milk was contaminated remains unclear. But it has been suggested that the Konosupo buyers were well aware of the risks. Any risk was ignored in order to obtain the cheap powdered milk at a price far lower than domestic milk that they could have bought. When the powdered milk arrived in Mexico, it was repackaged into Konosupo branded bags. At no point was this contaminated milk tested for any radioactive material, despite the risk of contamination from Chernobyl being clear to all. The contaminated milk was then shipped out to Konosupo stores, where the poor families had access to cheap staple foods. These families were totally unaware that they were drinking irradiated milk. In schools, the milk was given to children. Pregnant mothers were given the milk freely in a bid to reduce childhood mortality rates, all of these people were exposed to deadly radiation. Even when the radioactive material was discovered in January of 1988, there was no immediate mass recall of the powdered milk. For months, the milk was still being consumed. It was only through random health inspections that the radiation was discovered, with levels well exceeding what is considered to be safe. At first, Konosupo promised to destroy the remaining contaminated milk, and also promised to issue recalls. But it soon became clear that rather than solving the problem, they were only making it worse. Whistleblowers reported that the contaminated milk powder was only mixed with safe milk powder. This devious attempt to dilute the radioactivity only ensured that more people were exposed. Recalls were never completed, meaning more and more people were exposed to radioactive contamination. Perhaps even more insidious was a lack of meaningful investigation or inquiry into the scandal. No one has ever been held accountable. However, there is evidence to suggest that childhood cancer rates spiked as much as 300% in the years that followed. This Konosupo milk scandal is a disturbing example of greed, putting some of the most vulnerable people in grave danger. 
But it's also a reminder of the far reach that nuclear disaster can have, with contamination from Chernobyl reaching the poorest of Mexico years later. The next story focuses on Britain's attempt at obtaining its own nuclear bomb. During the 1950s and 60s, in the vast deserts of South Australia, the British government conducted nuclear weapons tests. But these deserts were far from empty, occupied by Aboriginal people, exposing them to deadly radiation. In the early 1950s, Britain was desperate to develop its own nuclear arsenal. The United States had shown the power and influence a nuclear bomb holds, and they refused to share their secrets. This left Britain to build and test its own bombs. Australia was selected as the site for these tests, with its deserts offering the seemingly perfect location for these tests. The Australian Prime Minister at the time, Robert Menzies, approved these nuclear tests without consulting Parliament, eager to maintain close relations with Britain and collaborate on future nuclear programs. Far from major cities to avoid public scrutiny, a number of primary sites were selected. The Montebello Islands off the coast of Western Australia, Emufield, and later Maralinga deep in South Australia. This was called Operation Hurricane, and it resulted in the first atomic bomb detonated on the Montebello Islands on the 3rd of October 1952. This test ensured Britain would be a member of the nuclear club. But over the next decade or so, more land-based tests were carried out. Hundreds of minor and 12 full-scale tests would follow. They sought to test the performance of the atomic weapons, the components, and investigate safety issues. At Maralinga, plutonium contamination was extensive, largely caused by minor tests. Some of these minor tests included the burning of plutonium, and is understood to have scattered as much as 22 kilograms of plutonium-239 dust across the desert. These tests were purported to be safe, but for those conducting them, there were serious risks. Australian airmen were tasked with flying through mushroom clouds to obtain samples, although they were not given any protective equipment. Those tasked with decontaminating the aircraft too received little to no protective gear, and in some tests, Australian soldiers were asked to stand a few kilometres away from the test site, facing away with their eyes closed. They were then told to march towards Ground Zero to assess conditions. As a result, many Australian soldiers would suffer from radiation sickness, cancers, and infertility. It is suspected that these soldiers were used as unwitting human experiments as to see the effects of radiation, though these claims are of course denied by the governments. The deserts where these tests were taking place were not, however, empty. People of the Pichun Chuchara and the Yungkun Jajara communities lived in this area. Some were given warnings, and some people were forcibly moved away, but many were not properly told, and plenty still remained in this area. This would mean, following the tests, many consumed animals contated by radioactive dust, drank contaminated water, and lived on radioactive soil. This resulted in all manner of illnesses, including blindness, radiation burns, and skin sores. In the years that followed, there were increased rates of cancer and birth defects, in these Aboriginal communities. By 1963, Britain no longer had a need for the Australian sites. The Maralinga site was officially closed in 1967, at which point Britain was obligated to clean up the contamination. However, surprise surprise, this wasn't done. Contaminated debris was buried in trenches, topped with concrete, whilst soil contaminated with plutonium was ploughed into the ground. A report whitewashed the cleanup, leaving the deadly contamination to affect so many. The reports were kept, the deaths in the Aboriginal communities were ignored, and soldiers' health complications were blamed on anything other than exposure to contamination. It was not until 1984 that Australian scientists conducted their own investigation, discovering the high levels of radioactive contamination, particularly with levels of plutonium. This soon led to a royal commission into what had happened, it found that these tests had caused widespread contamination, exposed soldiers and Aboriginal people to radioactive material, and that the cleanup efforts were woefully inadequate. The Commission called for compensation, the returning of the land to its rightful Aboriginal owners, and for a proper cleanup to be done, paid for by the British government. It took eight years, but in 1993, the British government paid £22 million towards the cleanup. 
all without accepting legal responsibility. Compensation to the Aboriginal community would come from the Australian government. A report into the soldiers who were exposed to the radiation showed that around 30% had died, mainly from cancer, at a very young age. Eventually, some types of cancers were deemed worthy of being compensated by the Australian government. To this very day, the area remains contaminated, and will likely remain so for the remaining 22,000 years of plutonium's half-life. The final disaster is one of the worst in history, but one that you have likely never even heard of. In the Brazilian city of Goiânia, the looting of an abandoned medical facility would lead to deadly radioactive contamination that affected the entire city. In 1987, an abandoned radiotherapy clinic was broken into by a pair of metal scavengers. The clinic had been unoccupied for some time, save for the occasional security guard. Crucially, some of the radiotherapy equipment had been left in the clinic. This equipment ought to have been properly disposed of and removed, but a complex legal dispute meant that it remained. In particular, a teletherapy unit that used beams of high-energy gamma rays to treat cancers was left in the derelict clinic. It was this device that the scavengers managed to take from the clinic, unaware of the radioactive material within. When these two men set about stripping the unit for parts to sell, they located a good amount of lead and a mysterious aluminium container. Smashing the small glass window of the container, they believed what was inside to be a worthless, powdery substance. It was, however, cesium-137. This powder would crumble at the slightest touch, capable of contaminating a wide area very quickly. Unsurprisingly, after handling the radioactive material, the scavengers were soon struck with illness. Inflamed skin, sickness, and diarrhea were dismissed by doctors as allergies or just food poisoning. A few days later, the scrap metal, including the container of cesium-137, was sold to a local scrap dealer by the name of Dave Alves Ferreira. Whilst the metal was left in a garage, Ferreira realised that the scrap metal was glowing. He soon discovered that the source of the light was the cesium-137 powder, but he didn't realise that this was a radioactive isotope. Fascinated by the material, he began to show the material to his friends and family. At one point, he gave it to his niece to play with. She rubbed it on her skin, pretending it was fairy dust. While she sat and played with this fairy dust all over her hands, the young girl even ate a meal, consuming the deadly material. Soon, the Ferreras and their friends began to experience symptoms of swelling, internal bleeding, and radiation sickness. It was Ferreras wife Maria who realised the cause of her family's illness, the glowing powder. But by this point, however, the material had been sold to another scrapyard, exposing more people as the metal was sold or contaminated other material. However, she managed to reclaim the material, put it in a plastic bag, and went to the hospital. The hospital staff soon realised the danger, and Brazil's nuclear commission descended onto the city of Goiânia. Their Geiger counters tracked the immense spread of the contamination. Maria's journey to the hospital had been by bus, exposing other passengers, who in turn could have spread the contamination as they went about their day. It is thought that as many as 112,000 people were exposed to the radiation. And of these people, it's thought that around 97% had been exposed to a dangerous dose that could have increased the risk of contracting cancer. Around 250 were found to have been severely contaminated, and of those, around 30 suffered greatly. This tragically included his six-year-old niece, who died just a month after exposure. She had immense swelling in her body, internal bleeding, and lung damage. So too did Maria succumb to radiation poisoning, dying the same day as her niece from internal bleeding, infection, and renal failure. Two of Ferreira's employees died too, having been exposed to the deadly radioactive material with cancers and lymphatic problems. Dozens of people were treated for radiation burns, homes were demolished, and contamination buried. But the damage went beyond the physical. Neighbours treated each other with suspicion that they might be contaminated, even the niece's funeral was targeted by thousands of people who protested her burial, fearing that her corpse might contaminate the entire city. When it was learned that the clinic left the deadly material easily accessible, the owners were found to be criminally negligent. The two scavengers were also found to be liable to, 
though they knew nothing about what they had unleashed. Over the years, increased rates of cancer in the city have been attributed to the incident, and remains one of the lesser known nuclear disasters in recent history. These are just some of the deadly and disturbing nuclear disasters. There is little doubt that nuclear material and energy has valuable uses, but if not properly controlled and used, it can expose countless people to invisible, insidious harm. Thank you.